Dear friends, uh, now the topics are open for discussion. We'll go by speaker. Uh, maybe we first open the topic that Mark spoke about, looking for Modi, Lada, and mitochondrial diabetes. So the 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 questions uh, and the suggestions and the comments, uh, very brief ones, may be directed towards him. Uh, I can just ask you the first one, uh, Mark, is is regarding that after that uh, that. Uh, uh, Hatsley's, uh, Hatsley's uh, Modi consortium. Uh, I mean, uh, is, the, is the diagnosis of various types of Modi has increased and how does it operate? Uh, uh. Yes, yeah, so uh, th that's a good question because the, certainly the uh, referral rates are increasing, certainly through the UK and, and from parts of Europe. And to there is still an expense with this. That's the major problem. Yeah. Um, so it's several hundred pounds, uh, depend, and it can be more for certain screening with sequencing. So what they've developed, and it is quite useful, is um, a guide. So you can put in certain key features into a lot algorithm that they have online. Yes. So things like family history is this, and age of diagnosis, gestational. Diagnosis. So it's the things I mentioned actually, um, and that so that'll give you a, it gives you kind of a, a, then a percentage risk of it being positive. So it, it gives you some guidance, um, and we tend to do what, what basically what we've done today with that algorithm I showed at the end is very much based upon that. But that, they use cutoffs as well. And the last question from his side is the while you describe the differences between the HNF1 alpha Modi and the type 2 diabetes in the young. Uh, do you take any markers of IR beyond CRP, like any acanthosis or skin tax or anything, uh, apart from BMI? Of course, you've taken BMI more than 30. Anything else was worthwhile? For, for the, so, sorry, for the different types of modi? No, differentiating HNF1 alpha from the type 2 diabetes in the young. Yeah, right, okay. So that, yes, it's a very good point because, again, um, there are certain forms of uh, obesity syndromes that can present. So that is a very good point. Yeah, thanks for that. So um, the acanthosis looking for certain um, obesity syndromes. I've got to say, actually, that um, quite often they're picked up by our pediatric colleagues yes. because they're quite markedly obese. Um, uh, the other thing I haven't touched upon today is the, um, the other co condition of um, familial partial lipodystrophy, which again, I don't know how, how, if that's a problem that you see in the Indian population, but again, it's something we see in the UK, and it's usually more marked in the women, uh, the phenotypes, easier to pick up in the women, but again, that has a certain approach in terms of genetic, the problem there with genetic testing, uh, we don't, it's not as clear cut in terms of candidate genes. Thank you. Any questions from the audience, please? Yes. Cornwall and Newcastle, they are geographically, diametrically opposed. Do you get pay, patients referral only restricted to your geographical area or you get uh, Scotlanders? Uh? Yeah, okay, so that's, that's a good question. So um, we, we get, for, for Modi, we have um, a Modi nurse who works throughout the region and that's very important for once we've de detected a family to then make contact with the other family members. It's, because actually it's a very important point this, is that once you've made a genetic diagnosis, the first question is, okay, well, I've got diabetes, but what about my children, my future grandchildren? So our nurse works as part of a UK consortium. What we have done as well, though, with the mitochondrial diabetes is because these patients have um, other problems uh, they often have, well they have the deafness but they can get other neurological problems, cardiac problems. We run a multi-center, a, 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 a multi-specialty clinic where I sit down with the neurologist, the ophthalmologist and we get patients from around the UK who will come along uh, for a single appointment where they'll see all the specialists in one go and then they'll come back a year later and we give guidance to the local physicians. So we run for the Modi, a regional service for the mitochondrial diabetes. It's a, it's a national service essentially. You've got a prodigy here in India. Would you like to extend your service? Because though we are not happy with the way the Indians are being treated, Newcastle is unique. Some of us have got full training. So would you like to extend your spectrum to other so that you'll get more uh, data and uh, yeah, activity? sure. Yeah. You know, there's lots of questions. So what's, what's intrigued me about this is one of the first questions I'd like to do research question with you, with, with the in, Indian groups, with Modi, is what about the high sensitive CRP? Is it, does it work in the Indian population? Um, is it a good distinguisher between HNF1 alpha and young type 2? In your career, regards to Alberti and... Uh, I'll do that. Yeah, and yes. the King's College, what is that? Stephanie, yes. Yeah. Can I have questions for Dr. Peter? Uh, yeah, you can ask questions. Uh, 
One more to Dr. Walker, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, uh, say, will your management plan uh, will be any different in Modi 2 gestation, uh, pregnant women, please? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so, um, we, the, the, I would, we, because of the, the, the risk, the risk to the, it's really to the risk to the baby in terms of uh, macrosomia. Um, and Andrew Hattersley did some really neat work showing that if the mum carried the mutation but the baby was normal, was, that they were at risk of macrosomia. And so, yes, it, it, the, um, if, if they do have guidelines for treating, if the glucose levels do become too high to protect the baby, then they will step in and treat. So it's not, it's a good, very good point. We can't, in pregnancy, you do have to be sometimes more proactive and treat with insulin or metformin to, to bring the, the glucose levels down. It's usually insulin we use. What is from the bats? <laughs> uh, can I have Sir, put, yeah. Question to Dr. Mark Walker. Sir, um, I, I had a patient uh, recently, a 13 year old girl with a you know, the diabetes, uh, which was not, uh, onset was not with a ketosis. And um, on evaluation, she had a, she is now on premix, twice daily premix control. And her father is, the uh, mother is diabetic and the paternal, maternal side also three generation family history. So which side? Maternal? Both sides, both, both sides. Both sides, yeah, yeah. And uh, she had a normal C-peptide, her GAD and IA2 antibodies were negative. I didn't do a HSCRP. Uh, so I sent a gen genetic testing for Modi. And HNF1 alpha mutation was found out in this girl. It was a new onset of, uh, it's a newly uh, described mutation. They don't know the significance of that. It has not been described so far. Yeah. So I have sent the family screening. I have sent the, both the maternal and paternal side blood samples for the genetic testing. I made to get the report. So suppose if this turns out to be a MODI, what will be the next step? Which sulfonylurea I should start? Or how can I go about in this patient? Yeah, okay. So assuming it is an HNF1 alpha, then, uh, then using... Um, uh, sulfonylurea would be a reasonable thing to do, but bearing in mind the risk of hypoglycemia. And I think it is, I, I can't un understate this, I can't overstate this too much because we think, well, because they're very sensitive, you can get very good glucose control, but it, the hypoglycemia can be devastating. So I think that the, you, sulfonylurea is fine. What we found actually, some of our MODI patients are just behaving like our general type twos because they're putting on weight like everyone else. So sometimes we use other agents such as the GLP-1 analogs, uh, we've used the gliptins. So although sulfonylurea is the first step, we, you've got to look, as I think it was mentioned earlier, about individualized treatments as well and, and just think beyond the kind of the guidance. No, but I would personally like to know your opinion, which sulfonylurea you'll start and in what dose and well, whether you'll overlap insulin. Yeah, so what we would do is we would, we would give a tiny dose. We use glycoside, 40 milligrams, uh, before breakfast, okay, and we sir. give them a blood glucose monitor. Okay, sir. And I had another patient who was uh, the diabetes diagnosed during pregnancy. And this uh, lady uh, had also a three generation family history of diabetes. And after delivery, we, during the pregnancy, we had uh, put her on insulin. After delivery, we sent a uh, genetic testing, and she turned out to be a glucokinase mutation. Right. HNF. So now sh her sugars are, the fasting is okay, but the postprandial comes to around 200, 250. So, should we treat her or we should leave it like that? You'll have to, you'll have to do the exchange. I don't know what these American units are. But what, what is it? In milligrams, milligrams per cent. No, no, what was it in millimoles per litre? Is it 10? Uh, millimoles, it will be around uh, uh, 11, 10. Yeah, 10 to yeah so yeah, I, we, we wouldn't treat her. We'll treat her. We would okay. just ob observe. And again, it's likely to be stable. We would still monitor for potential complications. So we don't just, we, we tend to do a, an annual check because they can get retinopathy. There are other obvious risk factors, but because by and large, we don't because when, if you, for our type twos, even when they have a hemoglobin A1C less than 7%, if you look at the CGMS, the recordings, they'll often go up to 11, 12 and come down quite quickly. Because the standard teaching is glucokinase mutation, the treatment is not required if, we're the, if she's not, unless she's pregnant, we don't yeah, treat the right. glucokinase, that's yeah. the standard. So thank you very much, and uh, I request now for the questions for Professor v Peter Nilsson. Rangarajan, no, I got just one question, sir. How frequently do you see LADA in your country, sir? And what is the statistical data you have recorded in your country, sir? LADA. LADA, LADA. LADA. How, how frequently you see LADA? Oh, so how frequently you see LADA? Oh, um, not that often. It's in, our, in our popular... 
it, so this is the kind of the late onset type one. We would probably, it's, it's around three to four percent. I mean, it's, it's not that high of our uh, population. And actually, in terms of the genetics, my understanding is that it's similar to type one. I mean, it, it, it's the same. So it's just type one diabetes presenting a bit later and we manage as type one. So um, we do, there used to be a thinking that it was a separate, you know, they used to call it type one and a half. I don't buy that. I think it's type one presenting a little bit later. Yeah, now for Peter, not for, okay. Yeah, Mr. Peter. Ramachandran. Question to Professor Ramachandran. Oh, Ra Ramachandran, okay, we'll call you later. Okay, Swedish gentlemen, there are two issues, sir, yes. Number one, DPP for inhibitors and HF. You, DPP for inhibitors and heart, heart failure. You rightly, uh, of course, the John Utkin's article, I'm very happy that a few days ago only it published, so the Swedish are so dynamic. The, the, the thing is about even in Medscape, just like you, John, Medscape, there was one article that, that didn't give much favorable reports of HF. They said that citagliptin saga, how long it's going to continue. So we're a bit worried. And another thing is cast. The people are very, of course, in India, after a long struggle, the, it is under price control, but despite these things, we are not we are not happy with the DP for inhibitor in our country because there is poor monitoring. There is till today in India nobody has got uh, pancreatitis. Of, of course, in US, uh, despite their remitted population, so we, we are not happy with the DP for inhibitor in a developing country setup. Would you like to comment? Number yeah. two, yeah, I got a second. Yes, number two. About well, we take one. Please, yeah. please, First. yes. So the issue of congestive heart failure and DPP4 inhibition is a difficult question. Some people advocate that we should measure BNP before starting to select the ones without increase in BNP. I don't know. As I mentioned, uh, the TECOS trial, citagliptin versus placebo, will be published rather soon, we hope, end of this year, early next year, and then we will learn much more. I guess that we will learn that some subgroups are more susceptible. We remember from the past the glitazones. It was a similar study, however, with a different mechanism. So in the end, I think we will learn to avoid gliptin treatment in some specific subgroups, maybe based on BMP or some other characteristics. But I think we should continue the efforts. We also have um, uh, other agents, other drugs, uh, the leader study in a few years, a Carolina study, we will know much more in the future. Nice. The other thing is the metabolic consequences of beta blockers and, uh, and uh, diuretics. Of course, the, the quality of life is very high in Sweden compared to ours. See, the combination might result in erectile dysfunction. Would you like to comment? Yes. You know, in the 90s, uh, people discussed very much about adverse metabolic effects uh, linked to beta blocker therapy, thiazide diuretics. I think it was exaggerated somehow because it is dosage dependent. We know that the old-fashioned non-specific beta blockers at high dosage were much more detrimental, but there are some modern beta blockers at lower dosage without causing so much of a metabolic problem. There are even vasodilating beta blockers. I guess that in established diabetes you can use whatever is available, including thiazide diuretics, very good to combine with uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs for improved uh, blood pressure control. Still, and now I speak on behalf of the European Society of Hypertension, uh, I have been a council member there, we caution to use high dosage of this combination treatment in pre-diabetes, I agree, but uh, still, there are so many patients in this world that there is a need for all the drugs, different combinations, to tailor the right therapy to the right patient. Diplomatic. Uh, what's your comment, uh, Nelson, on the, on the triglycerides as a risk factor? And uh, especially after Ram showed his findings of the hypertriglyceridemic West as a precursor of diabetes. Uh, because it is in line of the uh, guideline, American guideline, which says triglyceride not be treated. Uh, well, two answers. First, we have all the observational data showing exactly that this combination exists. There is something linked to hypertriglyceridemia, uh, hepatic steatosis, increased ways, for sure, there is something. But on the other hand, we know that interventions have not been so successful. But 
the most com uh, recent document is Mendelian randomization analysis. You know, this is a new way, and Mark, you know much more about this, to show causality. So it has been shown that genetic, uh, shown that genetic factors regulating triglycerides, glycemia, even insulin resistance, something linked to that is causally related to risk of myocardial infarction. HDL cholesterol is not. It's just a marker of something. It doesn't pay off to, to increase HDL cholesterol. I think if we believe in Mendelian randomization and causal inference, and I would be happy to know your view on this, there must be something in this cluster, hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, insulin resistance, but we don't exactly know how to approach it, how to treat it. Mark, do you believe in the causal relationship I mentioned here or not? I think uh, we'll pass on to Ram now where he will answer this question too. Uh, you, doctor, you want to ask Ram Chandran? Ram Chandran, the last uh, uh, presenter of the question. Uh, see, as Ram Chandran pointed out, diabetes is a pre preventable disease, primary prevention by lifestyle modification by sending SMS. We are able to achieve the results. Can it be extrapolated to the established diabetes also? Can we send the SMS to change the lifestyle? And the role of voice message, you said SMS. See, I don't know how much people are able to see that SMS. Able to use voice message so that to reach the people quickly, able to get the results better. In established diabetes, can be extrapolated that and your experience about that. I will end that. Yeah, we did a pi actually we did a pilot study on people with type 2 diabetes, randomizing them to people with SMS and non-SMS. And that has been already published earlier. That is a pilot study to see whether after sending the SMS there will be a better achievement of better HPA1C and better compliance to treatment. And we found that there is a significant reduction in HPA1C in a period of one year. So there is a small study where 200 patients were actually randomized. At this point of time, we are actually contemplating a larger study on exactly what you said. So definitely, when you continuously give them some advice, there will be some difference in their behavior, whether they are pre-diabetic or diabetes. For the first time, we have shown that there's a lot of talk on even WHO, but e-health and mobile technology. But this is one of the first time, actually, we did a randomized control trial showed a clinical outcome can be actually achieved by using SMS and information technology. And the great thing about this is that mobile telephones are easily available and it, the penetration is pretty high, especially even in a developing country like India. But the key point to this is that when you send SMS, it has to be actually grouped according to their uh, uh, stage of conversion. And that's a very big uh, issue. You have to actually identify them at what stage they are and they're going to tailor the SMS according to that to have a really effective uh, you know, results. That's, that's a problem. As we are running out of time, I think yes. we'll close uh, the wait, session. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, Murugananda, you are a general physician. We, Hang on. Hey, nah. See, we got plenty of time for this. We, no, no, no. Yeah, Ramachandran, uh, the issue is, according to John Ukin, 50% of the Chinese population would, might become pre-diabetics. So it has got enormous implication for the Indian subcontinent. So I think that in a prevention, the public health has, has to play a larger role. Because we, we want to give uh, metformin, you might say that I did origin trial, I want to give large. We want to do blood sugar, you might say HbA1c. So I think that George, I don't know who is funding you, that slide was meant again. See, somebody is funding from George Alba. So this, ideally, it should be done in an institution. If not in a public institution, or at least in a non-government institution like St. John's or CMC. Would you like to, maybe in the in future, when you, we know that your politics, okay, the family is set up. But we think that as a India has to benefit from your... Uh, sorry to interrupt, okay. we are no, running short of time. Ram Chandran, you can discuss because it during the... Old boy network exists in yeah. Old boy network exists so, in England. Thank you very much. You better. Thank you very much. We are winding up this session. Uh, I sincerely thank the chairpersons and the speakers for this excellent session.